Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lisa Levinson. I'm the campaigns director with In Defense of Animals, and we are absolutely thrilled to share our fireside chat today for World Frog Day with our esteemed wild animals campaigner. Um, and she, her name is Katie Nolan, and she is going to take it away today. Hey, Katie, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much, Lisa. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here um, in celebration of World Frog Day. It's not World Frog Day today. It was last Wednesday, but uh, we are we're still here talking about frogs and salamanders. So really happy to have you all joining us today. So I've got some slides to share with you all. Um, today, we are going to be doing some World Frog Day toad trivia, and we'll get a couple updates about our amphibian campaign. So um, I'll share a little bit about the in-person trivia that we did in Vermont, um, um, something about amphibian migration season, which is happening soon on the East Coast. It'll be happening uh, in the fall on the West Coast. Uh, we'll talk about the bullfrog import ban in California. Um, we have a couple updates to share about that. And then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. And then we'll announce our trivia winners. So with that, um, I'll go over the instructions for trivia. And I'll share this again at the end. So you don't have to remember it. But if you want to start writing your answer down in this format, that would probably be helpful. So there will be 10 trivia questions. Uh, so what we're recommending you do is type your answers to each question numbered 1 through 10. I guess there's 11, there's a final trivia question. So one through 10, and then your final question in the body of one email with the subject line trivia. And then you're going to send that email to info at idausa.org. And please send that in by 12.30 p.m. Pacific time or 3.30 p.m. Eastern time in order for your answers to get graded before we announce the winners. Uh, so the answers will be scored while we're talking about some campaign updates, and then we'll announce the winners at the end. We have something else exciting along with trivia. Uh, we have a prize, uh, three prizes actually. We're giving away three of our new Amphibians Rock shirts. Um, I'm wearing one right now uh, to demonstrate what they look like. They're pretty cool. Uh, so we'll be giving away three shirts to our top winners and then everyone has access to our 25% off coupon code frogs rock and I think that will also be included in the email we'll send out after the fireside chat as well. So with that I think we're ready to dive right in and get started with our trivia questions. So hopefully you have an email pulled up to type your answers or you're writing them down on paper. Um, but here we go. So our first question is what body part of the frog that is not part of the digestive tract, so digestive tract including mouth and tongue, assists with swallowing? So what body part of the frog assists with swallowing that is not already part of the digestive tract? So not mouth, not tongue, stomach, anything like that. Question two, and we'll look back over these questions at the end too, in case you miss one or need a little bit more time. What is the term for when male toads hitch a ride on the back of females? So a lot of the time uh, when they're moving to their, uh, their migration spots to mate, they, uh, the male toads will hitch a ride on the back of the female kind of uh, to get first dibs to mate sort of. And uh, the female does all the work carrying the, the male across to the breeding site. Uh, so there is a, a term for that. And that is what we're looking for. Our third question is, what is the term for amphibian hibernation? So amphibians hibernate a little differently than mammals do. Um, and we have a, a specific term for this. Um, it's pretty cool. Actually, some frogs, uh, they will 
this word, uh, the amphibian hibernate, they do this um, within the freeze line. So on um, in the top like foot or two of ground, uh, these frogs actually are able to stop their hearts from beating and they have like a type of antifreeze uh, in them that allows them to kind of survive within the, the freeze zone of the ground. So they're able to hibernate on the top level of the ground, which is pretty cool. So this is the term for amphibian hibernation. Question four, in addition to being over 40 degrees, what other condition is necessary to trigger a big migration night? So big migration nights are these nights where um, we see frogs, salamanders, toads moving en masse to their breeding grounds. And there are certain, um, certain things that have to be in place to trigger a big night. And one of those is the temperature has to be over 40 degrees. Usually there has to be minimal snowpack on the ground. And then there's one other factor that contributes to a big night happening. Question number five. This seasonal amphibian breeding site is where amphibians migrate to to mate and lay their eggs. So we've been talking about migration season. This is where these frogs go to. It's the term for the, um, I guess, the type of body of water that these frogs are moving to uh, to breed in, often in the spring on the East Coast and in the fall on the West Coast. Okay, our next round, round two, is identify the amphibian species. So we have got five images of various amphibians, and to get the question right, you have to properly identify the species. So I have a couple hints for each one. Uh, so number six, these amphibians actually have spot patterns that are unique to each individual and they're common on the East Coast. Um, a lot of times they're like the, the poster child for different uh, amphibian crossing programs. And number seven, uh, this is a pretty common frog. Um, and my hint for you is that you'd probably be able to identify them by their characteristic call. So the call they make kind of sounds like what their name is. Amphibian number eight, I'm sure you all have seen um, these before out and about. Um, these amphibians are known for their bumpy skin. Um, there's a myth that they give people warts, but that is actually not true. Um, those are the hints I'll give you for, for that one. And number nine, our very colorful amphibian here, is native to Central and South America. And then our hint for number 10, uh, these are very cool amphibians. They spend their entire lives in the water. They're primarily aquatic, uh, but they do have lungs. Uh, they're feathery red appendages. These um, things sticking out here, those are actually their gills. They have these like external gills that sort of flutter in the water and that's how they breathe. All right, and our final question, how many frogs do I have at my desk right now? It's our final question. So this is more of a guess. It's our, our tiebreaker question. Um, so go ahead and write your guess for that one. Edie, can you show us a little frog? Yeah, I can definitely introduce you to a couple frogs at my desk. Uh, we've got this fella here. He's our frog puppet. Uh, we're hoping to host some uh, children's frog events in the summertime, so he'll be helping me out with some story time. Um, got a couple other little frogs. So this little guy. <laughs> and uh, these are really cool. It's a guiro, I think is how you pronounce it. They're uh, little wooden frog instruments and 
make frog croaking noises. So got all sorts of frogs on my desk. So um, make your guesses. It might be a higher number than you think, but we'll see. Uh, so I'll just uh, run through the slides uh, one more time, just so you can make sure you have all of the questions. And again, remember we're sending these in an email. Um, what body part of the frog that is not part of the digestive tract assists with swallowing? What is the term for when male toads hitch a ride on the backs of females? And then three is the term for amphibian hibernation. Four, in addition to being over 40 degrees, what other condition is necessary to trigger a big migration night? And five, this seasonal amphibian breeding site is where amphibians migrate to mate and lay their eggs. And then these are our pictures again. So you're coming up with the, the name for each amphibian, the, the species for each picture. I'll just leave that up for a couple more seconds. And then our final question, how many frogs do I have at my desk right now? And so our instructions, uh, please send your answers to info at idausa.org. Um, and if you could do that by 12.30 or 3.30, so in the next 15 minutes while we're talking, if you could please send that um, that is how we will grade your answers and um, see if you've won our trivia prize. So type your answers numbered one through 10 and then um, also your final question answer. And if anyone needs me to go back, um, if you need me to read a question one more time, just let me know. You can put that in the chat. But if not, Thank you for playing Toad Trivia. I hope that was fun. I hope you learned a bit. We can kind of go over the answers to those at the end too. Um, so we actually did a version of Toad Trivia in person in Vermont. We partnered with a brewery called Stone Corral and uh, we hosted like a seven round trivia night, which was very exciting. You can see a picture here of some folks uh, doing their picture round. It was a little different. We did a... Um, is this an amphibian or not uh, kind of question round. And a couple more, more photos. There's our, our little froggy mascot came along too. And um, you can see the shirt that we had created for the event. Um, so something we really emphasized during our trivia event was why it's so important to talk about frogs and care about frogs and amphibians in general. So besides being sentient beings who deserve to live their lives free from harm, amphibians are an especially vulnerable part of the animal population. So over one third of amphibian species are at risk of extinction and around 200 species have already gone extinct since 1980, which is really alarming. They face a range of threats, including pollution, infectious diseases, habitat loss, climate change, and overharvesting from the pet and food trades. Frogs are also really, really important to the environment. They're uh, bioindicator species, um, which means they are uh, their presence is a great way to tell whether an ecosystem is doing well or not. Uh, they require suitable land and aquatic habitats. So presence of frogs shows that you have um, quality land and aquatic habitats in that area. Uh, they're very susceptible to illness from pollution due to their very porous skin. Uh, so again, um, you have to have like really clean uh, land and water habitats for them to live in. And they're affected significantly by poor water quality, runoff, and habitat modification. They're an integral part of the ecosystem, and they're really awesome. So it's very important that we talk about frogs and what we can do to help them. So another big part of our um, World Frog Day 
trivia focus was amphibian migration season. And this is something we've talked about in uh, some of our previous webinars, which I'll provide the links to in a bit. Um, we had this flyer created for our event and um, we'll be making it available online soon. Um, so essentially one of the most critical points of a frog's life is migration season. So this starts in early spring on the East Coast when the temperatures begin to rise above 40 degrees at night. And um, if you haven't sent in your trivia questions yet, I might be about to give you an answer to one of them. So out west, uh, frogs and other amphibians move usually during the fall, during the rainy season. So the large migrations occur with the first warm nights of the rainy season. So we need a combination of 40 degrees, warmish rains, and uh, not really any snowpack. The ground has to be pretty clear. But remember, a lot of frogs, because they have this um, kind of like antifreeze in their body, they're able to come out um, when it seems really cold, like 40 degrees is pretty cold. And a lot of the times there's still like a bit of ice or snow banks and these frogs are already out moving. So happens um, earlier than you think it does sometimes on the East Coast. Um, something else is that the juveniles who hatch, so these, these frogs, they migrate uh, from like upland wooded habitats to lower laying um, breeding grounds and they lay their eggs and these eggs hatch. And so the juveniles oftentimes then later migrate back out of the greeting rounds. So a really, really huge obstacle to these amphibians is that often they have to cross roads to get to these breeding grounds. And so many are killed by cars, which absolutely decimates amphibian populations. So if you think of roadkill, a lot of the times people think of these like larger animals like deer or raccoon. And of course, that's very tragic and sad when those animals get hit by cars. But um, the majority of animals who die crossing roads are actually amphibians. Um, they migrate by the hundreds and thousands. And a lot of the times they're moving at night when it's rainy. So visibility is pretty low and they have soft bodies. So when they're run over, uh, you can't really see any remnants um, of them on the ground. And Sometimes scavengers will uh, have cleaned up the bodies by the morning time. So uh, basically these massacres happen and they go largely unnoticed and untalked about. So we're really trying to raise awareness for migration season and how important it is to not drive on rainy nights when frogs could be moving or um, different programs that are out there helping these frogs move across the road. So we're trying to raise awareness of that. So if you wanted to know more, last year we celebrated World Frog Day and also Save the Frogs Day, which happens in April, with two events. We had a World Frog Day amphibian expert panel where we had amphibian experts come and talk about migration season and other threats to amphibians and how you can help with that. So we have the YouTube link here. Um, and we also hosted a Toad Detour virtual film screening. And Toad Detour is a, a toad crossing program that was actually started by our own Lisa Levinson. She was um, very involved with this crossing program. Uh, so if you missed those two events, yeah, thank you, Lisa, for all of your, your work helping and saving the toads. Uh, really, this, this film is incredible. It's it's absolutely adorable and inspiring. And um, it really just shows how, you know, if, if you're finding frogs or toads or salamanders crossing near you, you can go out and start your own crossing program. It's really, um, really incredible to see um, how people come together in this film to help these toads. So if you missed either of those two um, events we put on. The links are up here on this page, but also they're available on our YouTube channel. So you can just find In Defense of Animals YouTube channel and um, watch our previous events. 
So one other thing we've been working on through our amphibian campaign is this California bullfrog import ban. And so if you are in California, you may have gotten our regional alert. We asked our California supporters to reach out to the California Fish and Game Commission to ask them to ban the sale and import of bullfrogs. Um, basically, uh, frogs are piled on top of each other in these buckets. They're uh, shipped um, across the, they're shipped from out of the country. Uh, they're sold in live markets, often for people to eat. Uh, they just live horrible lives. They're raised on these crowded frog farms. Um, just like a really horrible thing that uh, we were trying to stop. And excitingly, the Fish and Game Commission voted unanimously to ban the sale and import of bullfrogs, which was a huge victory. Uh, In Defense of Animals was a member of Save the Frogs Bullfrog Action Group, and we'd been testifying on this issue for months, and um, the other member organization, Save the Frogs, uh, I think has been working on this issue for years. So this is a really, really long anticipated victory. Um, so a couple things we're still working on in this campaign. It's a little bit open-ended. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Department is actually who enforces these rules. Um, so we're still waiting for the Fish and Wildlife Department to implement this ban and then enforce it. Uh, so stay tuned. There may be some opportunity for you to um, either write comments or show up to a meeting that's actually happening April 4th. And uh, part of the plan that Fish and Game Commission approved was also to kill bullfrogs in the wild. Um, I guess there's a overpopulation of bullfrogs in the wild in California. Um, so something we will continue to do is advocate for non-lethal solutions so that no bullfrogs are killed, uh, whether they are from farms in the uh, live markets or in the wild. So those are all of the updates I have on our amphibian campaign, but please stay tuned for more updates in the near future and for ways you can get involved. We have Save the Frogs Day coming up in April. We'll have Amphibian Appreciation Week in May. And um, again, I mentioned there'll be a couple uh, children's uh, focused events that are happening locally in Vermont. Um, so if you are nearby, keep that in mind. So those will be over the summer. Um, and thank you so much for playing trivia. I think we've got about four minutes until we need all of your questions sent in. So maybe I'll pop back over to the trivia slides just to go over the questions one more time if you have not sent them in. Let's see if I can. All right. So. Again, we have a couple minutes, and then once it hits 12.30 or 3.30, whichever uh, side of the United States you're on, um, I will give the answers to these questions. But again, if you, sub like, if you send in the answers after 12.30, they will not count. Um, and one more time, the email address is info at idausa.org, and please put trivia in the subject line so we can see your email come in and flag it for grading. Info at idausa.org. So we've got body part of the frog that is not a part of the part of the digestive tract that assists with swallowing. The term for when male toads hitch a ride on the back of female toads the term for amphibian hibernation. In addition to being over 40 degrees, what other condition is necessary to trigger a big migration night? This seasonal amphibian breeding site is where amphibians migrate to mate and to lay their eggs. And then we've got our picture around. Um, our 
little spotted friend over here in the corner whose um, each individual spots are unique. Uh, we've got our, our vocal frog down here who's known for their, um, their call, their unique call. Our friend known for their bumpy skin. And our very colorful frog friend over here, uh, native to South America and Central America. And then these guys down here whose um, gills are external and that's how they, they breathe through these red appendages here. And then don't forget our final trivia question, how many frogs? Does campaigner Katie Nolan, so me, how many frogs do I have at my desk right now? And so please send your answers in. This is your final minute to get those questions in. And yeah, I see in the track the chat question 11 is the real head scratcher yeah it's pretty much just a guess how many how many do you think are are on here there there are a few all right it is 3 30 on the east coast 12 30 on the west coast uh hit that send button get those last answers sent in um i'm about to give you the answers so if you're sending your answers in after now then um they will not count so make sure you have hit that send button gotten those answers sent in all right let's go over the answers so what body part of the frog that is not a part of the digestive tract assists with swallowing? Um, you're welcome to put the answer in the chat if, uh, if you think you know it. Yes, eyes. Um, so amphibians have these, these big eyes and they're able to kind of like blink them. So when they like, they, catch a bug and they swallow, the eyes kind of pop in their head and force um, what they're swallowing down. So they um, actually have eyes that assist with swallowing, which is pretty cool. Uh, so the term for when male toads, toads hitch a ride on the backs of females. And I actually was not familiar with this term until um, Lisa shared it with me. Uh, I guess she saw this a lot while um, she was involved with the toad detour crossing um a lot of those male toads hitching a ride <laughs> uh, that's a great answer terry freeloading <laughs> um and lazy yep i agree <laughs> but again getting those that first dibs uh for mating so kind of important evolutionary i guess um so the answer to this one is amplexus. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but. That is right. You're right, 100%. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, so that is that is when they hitch a ride. And I'll type it in the chat for um, spelling purposes, amplexus. And the term for amphibian hibernation, did anyone get that one? Yes, many people got that. Awesome. Yeah, brumation. Um, so brumation is the term for amphibian hibernation. Uh, four, in addition to being over 40 degrees, what other condition is necessary? Um, I kind of gave this one away when we were talking about later about migration season. Uh, the answer is rain. So it has to be rainy, above 40 degrees, and um, also low snowpack kind of comes with them. But that's like an unofficial addition. And this seasonal amphibian breeding site is where amphibians migrate to to mate and lay their eggs. That is a vernal pool. So it is a um, 
sometimes I guess if you look at it, you'd probably think it was just like a glorified puddle, but these are uh, small bodies of water that are seasonal. They like, don't exist in the, the summertime and the fall um, on the East coast. Um, and they come in the spring when the, the snow melts and it starts to rain and these pools fill up. And the reason why frogs lay their eggs there is, and, and salamanders and other amphibians is because there are no predators or less predators. So if you think like a larger body of water has fish in it, who I'm sure would enjoy eating uh, frog and salamander eggs, but these vernal pools, because they're seasonal, uh, fish don't live there. So uh, the eggs are able to be a little bit safer and have more of a chance um, of hatching. Our identify amphibian species picture round over here in the corner, we have our yellow spotted salamander. And um, below him, we have our spring peeper. They have that characteristic peeper noise that they make in the springtime. Here in the middle, we have our American toad. And then in the corner, we've got our poison dart frog. I believe this is specifically the strawberry poison dart frog, but we were just looking for a poison dart frog. And then here in the corner, we have our axolotl, who are actually amphibians, which is pretty cool. And then the highly anticipated answer to our final question round, how many frogs do I have on my desk? The answer is 29. I have 29 different little frogs hiding around all over my, my desk. So very exciting. All right. Thank you for playing and thank you for uh, learning more about frogs with me and um, I hope this was enjoyable and I think we have some time for questions unless we're ready to announce trivia winners um, I think we probably want to take just five minutes for the win okay cool let's uh, take some questions first if there are any yes um, so I know that Mary has been collecting some questions for us in the chat. So Mary, do you want to join us? Mary's with In Defense of Animals. Hi, Mary. And you might want to unmute yourself. I do that. Um, there's just one question that I saw in there. One person wanted to know, um, are any of those frogs that you showed poisonous or salamanders or axolotls or toads? Yeah, good question. Um, well, our poison dart frog is absolutely poisonous. Um, so that's one I know for sure. Um, they have like, uh, they kind of have poison secretions on their skin. And that's part of the reason why they're so brightly colored. They warn predators um, that they're poisonous. I believe if I'm remembering correctly, this spotted salamander is also slightly, like is toxic if you eat them. So like, they're not poisonous to humans, but um, I think to other predators, they um, either are poisonous when you eat them or they secrete some sort of poison. There's something about them that is poison, but they're not uh, dangerous to people. There is also a question about um, if there's a group in Sacramento that helps with migration. Do you know of any in that area, in California, Northern California? Yeah, that's a great question. So I personally do not know of any crossings in Sacramento, but I would be surprised if there aren't. So what I would recommend is just Googling or looking up amphibian crossing program, Sacramento or amphibian crossing program, Northern California, because these programs exist all over the country. Um, there, are, there are frog populations all over that need our help and assistance. And something else uh, that we like to emphasize is that um, if there's a frog crossing program, but it's a bit of a ways away from you, we highly recommend either, um, you know, kind of starting your own that's local or just not making that drive on those really rainy nights. Because oftentimes you can end up killing more amphibians on your way to a crossing program than you will saving them there. Um, but if there is one in your local area, I highly recommend reaching out and joining. And if not, um, start your own. 
And that might sound really daunting, but it's it's very doable. So I live in Richmond, Vermont, and we are actually just starting our own crossing program this year. Um, we reached out to a couple bigger programs that are uh, further away uh, who were more than willing to provide us with resources that they have. Uh, so we've gotten some like data counting sheets and their uh, training videos. So absolutely, if you cannot find a crossing program near you, think about starting your own, reach out to any programs that are in the nearby vicinity, and I'm sure they would be happy to guide you in doing that. Wonderful. It looks like uh, Bob has shared um, some of the winners. I don't know if you wanted to. Yep, those are our three winners. Sandra Alves, Cami Hoffman, Susan McCutcheon. Uh, we'll be in touch and uh, send you a shirt. Congratulations awesome. and thank you for playing. Yeah, congrats. Woohoo. Thank you for being our amphibian knowledge champions. Um, great job on winning our shirts. Um, thank you all for being here. And again, we've got that 25% off uh, discount code frogs rock so that is available to everyone if you do want one of our fun little amphibian shirts um that is available on our website so yes and i want to take a moment and really thank uh, bob who was helping to to determine the winners and bob is our development director at in defense of animals so we really appreciate him doing this and also uh, appreciate him coming up with this great idea to have these fireside chats to share some of our, our work behind the scenes with our campaigners and other, other programs at IDA. Well, I appreciate you guys too. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, well, congrats. Right, thanks, um, and I think, and maybe I made this up, but I thought I saw someone put in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing it now, but um, I guess I could talk a little bit more about um, what else can be done for frogs during migration season. So I keep referencing like uh, find a frog crossing group. And so those are groups of people who go out um, you know, with their buckets and their hands and they're physically helping frogs move across the road during those big nights. Um, but something else is actually... Uh, permanent crossing structures. And so I know uh, maybe you're familiar with the recent one that was uh, put in, uh, is that the Wallace Annenberg? Is that the name of it, I think? Yeah. It's, it's the Wallace Annenberg um, Wildlife Crossing. That's the largest wildlife crossing that uh, will be, uh, is in process of being built across the Highway 101 in uh, Southern California. Yeah, so that is like a very huge crossing, but there are also these smaller crossing crossings, and we have one uh, located in Moncton, Vermont. It's actually a culvert, and it goes under the road and has these uh, concrete barriers that sort of funnel frogs and toads and salamanders to this tunnel so that they can cross under the road instead of over it. Um, so these culverts um, are kind of growing in popularity. We're really trying to get the word out there that they work. And sometimes these crossing programs, uh, you're collecting, you're helping frogs, but you're also collecting data to show that, hey, this is a really big crossing site. Uh, there might be a need here for a culvert. Um, so really advocating for culverts to be put in in certain areas. And so that's another solution to this uh, frog migration um, issue for them having to cross roads is putting in permanent crossing structures. And then one other solution is uh, road closures. So a lot of times if there's a road that um, there's a relatively easy detour um, on those nights that you know might be big crossing nights, um, roads can be closed. So you can go to your, um, your city council or transportation department and see if they would be willing to work with you on creating a road closure for certain nights in the spring to protect those frogs from getting hit by cars. So those are some other solutions uh, to helping frogs during migration season. And I also want to say um, 
you know, this is kind of like a growing campaign for us. So we've been doing a little bit of amphibian work, but please stay in touch with us. Uh, hopefully we'll be expanding our initiatives and there'll be more ways for you to um, take action for frogs and um, stay in the loop. Yeah, uh, Katie, there's another really great question here. Is there a website or an app uh, for Amphibian Crossing Watch? Some sort of dates where you can learn about when the toads are on the move or the amphibians are, are moving and this person was sharing from the Northeast. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there's one group who I really love. They're called um, the Harris Center for Environmental Conservation. And I'll pull up um, their website and put it in the chat. But um, they have a salamander forecast. So what they do is uh, each night of the week, they color it kind of like red, yellow, or green based on what the weather will be and whether or not they anticipate amphibians to be moving. Um, and that is located in like the Monadnock region of New Hampshire. Um, but they on their website also link to um, other crossing programs around the East Coast. Uh, so if they're not near you, they have... Um, some programs that you can get involved with um, in other states. So here's their um, their main amphibian web page. And so a lot of these uh, these programs work together as well. Um, they're state by state. And one of our goals is to build um, state and regional coalitions so that we can kind of compile our amphibian data and have it uh, speak to each other so that we can kind of like see see the data mapped in a, in a broader um, sense. But a lot of states do have state-by-state -state maps. So you'll see one if you go on the Harris Center website. And there's also the uh, Vermont like Herpetology Atlas, I think it's called. Um, and they have a like a map for Vermont where all of the big crossing spots are. are. And so like when you're out, um, if you, get in touch with a crossing uh, program in your state, usually they either have a database or can reference you to a larger database for the state. And uh, we really like to keep track of what amphibians we're seeing, which amphibians are on the move when. And so there are ways you can kind of like enter that data in and say like, oh, I saw, you know, three spotted salamanders move last night. And you can kind of enter that in the database and it'll populate and say like, oh, so here's the amount of spotted salamanders we've seen at this specific crossing site over the years. So. Awesome. That is yeah. amazing to hear about that. Um, and one more time for the, the uh, question about the group in Vermont, the name of it. Uh, I believe I put in the chat box that it's the Vermont Herpetology Program and you can check it out. They've got a whole listing on their website to, to look at. And if anybody happens to be in the Philadelphia area, the toad detour, which I helped to start many moons ago is still going on each year. It's a big volunteer effort and it is actually a detour. So the street is closed with permission of the Philadelphia Streets Department. There are barricades that are put in place. And then outside the barricades, people with their families help to move the uh, toads and toadlets across the road. Um, so it's a wonderful way to, to get involved. And that is yeah. now run by the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. And again, if you uh, did not join us for the Toad Detour film screening, uh, definitely check it out. It's up on our YouTube page. It is a fantastic video. Um, so highly recommend watching that. And Lisa, I don't know how to spell uh, Skogel Center, but if you uh, <laughs> <laughs> put that link in the chat for people, that would be great too. I will do that. That is one of the most difficult words to spell, <laughs> but I will <laughs> do it. And um, yes, the Toe Detour movie really does go into some depth about how to start one of these programs and the um, just the call to action that anyone can do this. If you see toads that are on the move in your neighborhood, you might. I know I'm in Topanga, California, and we do have toads that are moving. 
uh, when it rains. And I can certainly hear them every night outside now that we have had some rain, we have some water in the creeks and they're very active. So it's a really exciting time. There was also a question about when this might be happening. So on the East Coast uh, of the United States, April is a good time for the, for the, the toads, especially to, to cross and the frogs often cross together with them. And then they're, they're babies, they cross on the way back. They, they leave the, the waterways and go out back into the woods. And so that usually happens in um, like late May or June. It's about a month in between while, and that's how long it takes them to develop from eggs into um, little teeny tiny toadlets or froglets that are the size of your fingernail of your pinky. That's how tiny they are when they cross um, out of their mating grounds. So. Yeah, definitely. And and one other thing, if you, you know, if you're someone like, oh, I'm really interested in this, but I, I don't want to go out uh, at night when it's raining and cold <laughs> to move amphibians across the road, I completely understand. But something you can do is just not drive on those nights. That's a really huge thing is um, kind of minimizing the amount of cars that are on the road during these potentially big nights. So if it's, you know, above 40 degrees and rainy, um, kind of in the spring or fall, depending on where you are, again, um, don't drive if you don't have to. Tell your friends not to drive. Um, so that's something a little lower stakes that you can uh, you can do. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I think, let's see, we may be, I think we are at the end of our question. So it might be time to, to wrap up. If anyone has any other questions, you're welcome to, to put them in the chat box. But it looks like Mary's given us the okay that we've gotten all the questions. Um, so. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us and for asking these terrific questions. I just want to take a moment to, to um, thank the folks from IDA and just add them here. We'll add Bob and also Mary, if that's okay. We'll just um, add you here for a moment and just to, to take a moment to... So all of us can thank all of you for joining us for this really special and this is special event that we've done. And it's the first time we've ever done a Toad Trivia type of event. And so you guys helped us to make it happen. And, and also to Katie for putting it together. I learned so much and I, I actually thought I knew a lot about <laughs> Toads, but I learned even more about all sorts of amphibians. So it was such a pleasure to to learn this. People are saying in the chat, thanks so much, learned a lot, going to get more involved in helping our amphibian friends. That's our goal. That is the purpose of doing this today. So we're just thrilled that you want to get involved and to help um, locally in your area. That's fantastic. Yeah, Katie, anything else you want to share? Nothing really other than thank you for being here. Thank you for playing our trivia. Thank you for caring about caring about frogs and amphibians. I know that um, it's easy for these uh, more charismatic, uh, larger, furrier animals to get a lot of the attention. So um, thank you for showing up to talk today about the, the little slimy guys. Um, Got to show them some love too. So I appreciate you all being here. Thank you to everyone and wishing you a very happy World Frog Day. And stay tuned, we'll be doing more, as Katie mentioned, for a World Amphibian Week and also for Save the Frogs Day. So there's lots coming up and we hope that you'll stay tuned. Take Definitely. care, everyone. Thanks so much Bye. for joining. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>